The Mac Observer's Mac Geek App, episode 688 for Monday, December 18th, 2017. <laughs> Welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show where you send in cool stuff found, questions, tips. We share the uh, first and last one and the middle one we try to answer. In fact, the goal is for every single one of us to learn at least four new things each and every time we get together. It's still 2017, so the number's still four. The jury's out on what's going to be, what's going what to, what's going to happen to that number in 2018. We don't even know. We don't even know. That's that's the future. We we don't uh, we accept time as a linear construct for the purposes of this show. We 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 know it's not, but we accept it that way. Sponsors for this episode include Otherworld Computing. We're going to talk about their USB C travel dock and their Aura Pro 10 SSDs. But first, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton, and here in Fairfield, Connecticut, John F. Ron. Would would we say that you're in Fairfield, Connecticut, John F. Braun, at the same time as me? Is, is that like does that fit with our acceptance of time as a linear construct? My understanding of the dynamics of the space time continuum is that yes, this is entirely possible. Okay, all right. Though so it we, could be improbable. It, it could be improbable. I mean, I don't like time. I, I really don't think that time is is a linear thing. I think it's really an abstract concept that we've just all agreed to to see in a certain way so that we can relate to each other. <laughs> hey, uh, on Facebook, you know, Robbie posted, he actually posted a, a question and it was Boy, just, a, just diving right in. I'm diving right in. Wow. Yeah. Well, things are getting in, weird, man. I don't know. Don't, should we, should we not? Yeah, I'm going to stick off. with Robbie. Then actually I have a question to ask you. Uh, but uh, Robbie posted a poll asking how many people use the natural scroll direction on their trackpads or magic mice versus how many people use the unnatural uh, or non, I don't want to say it's unnatural. It's just not natural. You uncheck the box for natural. Uh, and, and he linked in that post. So he linked in that post to a cool stuff found called scroll reverser from pilotmoon.com. And what's handy here is if you say, and this is not a weird thing for those of you that, that don't have both on the same computer, what scroll reverser does make sense. You could set natural scrolling, which and by natural scrolling, what Apple means by that is when you scroll up on a page, like, like you use two fingers and scroll around, when you do that on a web page, the page moves up. Whereas in the old days, scrolling up like that, it would go the other direction. Um, and either can feel natural, to be perfectly honest with you. It's just whatever you're used to. Well, you might want it that way, the natural way, on your trackpad. But on your Magic Mouse, because you're used to the whole concept of a scroll wheel when you have a mouse in your hand, you might want it to go the other direction and therefore... Uh, you might want it to be reversed. And that's what scroll reverser lets you do. It lets you really customize all this stuff, which is pretty cool. Right. Uh, it could be, it could be. Yeah. Depending on which way you roll. I, uh, and I think or which way you scroll. You <laughs> <laughs> There's we the title for the, the title. show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we know each other way too well. This is scary. But I think your question to me, Dave, would be, what do you do, John? Was that, that your question? No, no. In fact, I'm going to, oh, I'm just okay. going to jump right over it and go to my question. So I, mm -hmm. yeah, I was driving home uh, because we're recording this late at night, not that late, but later than normal. And my son had a hockey game or whatever tonight. So we pushed the schedule later and I was driving home and earlier today it was snowing. It maybe, you know, mid twenties on the old temperature there on the thermometer and it was snowing all day, not a lot of snow, but just kind of, you know, constantly drizzly snowing. And on my way home, it's raining, but it's 25 degrees outside. Now, this happened three or four days ago with the same thing here. 
What that means is we get snow, nice layer of snow. Then we get a crusty layer of ice on top of it. And anywhere that you might have cleared snow from just turns into icy death. So then this is happening because it's raining. You know, it's raining from up above. But, but so it's here. water in the sky. But yeah. once it hits 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 the ground then, temperature here then on terra problems. firma is is well below freezing yeah so what i need you to do because you're a smart guy i need you to like figure out how to stop the clouds from acting this way and if you can't do that can you give us a quick tip on on maybe fixing a bad handbrake rip i could i mean the solution to the you know slippery problem is you know, you have your local, uh, whoever does your roads, you lay down the salt of whatever sort. Yeah, I'm not worried. Well, yes, thing. for the roads. Yeah. But I like, I'm talking about like my driveway and every, like my decks and everything are just going to be a disaster for the next three days. Yeah. Well, I, I just say just, you know, hide in your house. That's for what you do. A few days and uh, you have you to know, collect some, yeah. uh, go to the store, get your bread, get your milk, get your eggs, make French bread. toast. That's why I assume everybody. Why do people? I don't know. Why? I, don't I, I know. still don't know why those specific items are all depleted when I go to my local grocery store when there's a storm it. coming. It That's just it. doesn't get me. So, but your question to me, Dave, and it's a very good question. So the other day, Dave, as I often do, so I get some uh, DVDs from various sources or Blu-rays. Uh-huh. Um, and you've helped me with a Blu-ray thing with an article that you did. Yeah. Oh, for ripping them. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, because yep. you have to you have to do something extra. Right. But the thing is, so the other day I was running Handbrake. I had a DVD from the library, and uh, I had not yet watched it, and they have a time frame. So what I typically do, which I think is within the spirit of the law, is I'll rip it, store it on my NAS, uh, use a Synology to watch mm-hmm. it, and then when I'm done, I'll erase it. So I think that's within the spirit of the law would you would I'm, you uh i'm sure you remember to erase every single one of those john well i do no absolutely no i'm I'm, I'm quite honest but oh, for rentals go. i do yeah for things okay. that i own well that's different right but anyways the other day so i ran handbrake and it goes through a couple of passes typically so it's like yeah i'm scanning your dvd everything's great and, okay but then what happened i i don't know what i did i don't know if it was a recent os update because every now and then, Dave, I've, I've found, especially with High Sierra, I'd like to reinstall the OS to try to maybe take care of some lingering issues. I don't know if it's something you want to do every day or every week or every month, but I, I think it may be good practice. What do you think? Reinstalling your OS? just Well, going to recovery and saying, you know, yeah. download it and reinstall it. Just I to- had to do that last night on my laptop Mm -hmm. uh, because I actually, and we'll talk about this maybe a little later, but I wound up turning off system integrity protection uh, to do another thing. And after I went into recovery mode, I just went to the terminal. I disabled SIP and then rebooted back around. And it's like, yeah, uh, OS won't. It was that standard issue where it said it couldn't find OS installer dot MPKG. It was like, oh crap. So I just reinstalled. It was easier that way. So here's what happened. Yeah. So I put a DVD in there. It saw it. Handbrake knew it. You know, it saw it. And it started going through its process. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I'm scanning it. I'm checking things out. And then I'm getting ready to rip. And then it's like, yep, I'm done. And I'm like, "Mm, that's not good. Here's the thing. Handbrake and other ripping utilities need access to uh, one of the... So the the content on a lot of uh, media is encrypted. Um, Well, how do you unencrypt it? Well... One way to do that is that there is this library called libdvdcss. And that's typically stored in your, let me do PWD, which is print working directory, which I'm looking at on another machine right now. So typically that's stored in user uh, slash USR slash local slash lib. But it wasn't working. I'm like, what's up with this, man? So I did a bit of surfing. And one suggestion was if Handbrake immediately fails, maybe your decryption library uh needs fixing sure okay and um brew install lib dvd css uh well i used cake uh, oh cake brew yeah, yeah yeah so i used cake brew but here's what i did is dave what so is? the thing cake is brew? but but there was an additional well there was a problem here so i tried to so i'm like you know i should probably update that library because i looked at it and it was very old sure 
on my system. And I, I don't even know where I got it from. Um, here's the deal. When I tried to run Cake Brew or Brew in general and tried to install, so one of the packages that you can install is, surprise, lib DVD CSS. Yeah. When I tried to install it, it's like, well, yeah, there's already a copy in this other directory, so I'm really not going to do what you asked me to. <laughs> it basically said, I already see something in the directory sure. where this is supposed to be, so I'm not going to overwrite it. And I'm like, okay. So the solution was to go into slash user local lib, delete anything that had lib DVD CSS in it, and then run brew package installer, yep. which uh, other, uh, I'm sure others support it as well. And once I did that and ran it again, everything was great. It, yeah. Was so fine. if you had run brew from the command line and we're, we're just talking about I mean, it really is just installing a library that needs to be there for for handbrake. But if you had done that from the command line, you probably would have been presented with a more verbose failure message that included uh, a, a essentially instructions on how to invoke brew in a way that it would overwrite what was already there. And okay. it, without having to go through the rigmarole that you went through. It's just, it's a different rigmarole. It's no easier or more, hmm. more harder. It's just like, if you do that, if you do brew from the command line, it's really good about saying, Hey, I couldn't do this. However, if you want me to just tell me this way and I'm off to the races. Okay. So, yeah. Well, the, the, the client that I used did, I mean, it gave me an error. It basically said, I see something linked from a place that I should put stuff. So I'm not going to do that. Sure. But yeah. No, I get your point. But once I did that, work great. So um, cool. I I don't know what I did to break it though. I don't know if it was reinstalling the OS. Oh, I bet reinstalling the part. OS did. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so it, it broke some symbolic link or, or well, some. No, it sounds like it put an old copy of libdvd CSS out there that Handbrake didn't like. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, because it was. It sounds like one was there, just not the latest one. And there you go. Yeah, it's just you know Handbrake gave a kind of weird error saying I, I give up I, I don't know how to deal with this because <laughs> it was encrypted because the library wasn't yeah up to date I guess I guess yeah well that was a nice little jam session on a quick tip there six minutes but you know <laughs> it's all good <laughs> uh, let's see we'll burn through some of these other ones uh, Alex on Facebook posted he had asked a while back how to uh or pondered if there was a way to change the color of a custom tag in the finder and he says there is he says i found it in finder preferences tags and uh and you can add a new tag and and change the color right there so thanks for uh thanks for letting us know that alec alex sorry and then also on facebook uh, in our Facebook group, MacGeekab.com slash Facebook, uh, Aaron posted, he said, I just got a free Apple TV 4K from DirecTV Now. All I had to do was sign up for four months of service at 35 a month. A no brainer for me as I was on the PS View at $40 a month. But even still, even if you don't need a, um, a DirecTV subscription, Getting an Apple TV 4K for 140 bucks, that's a pretty good deal. So, you know, there you go. Just sign up for DirecTV now for a short period of time. Wow. Good to go. I know. It's pretty good. First, I'm going to need a 4K TV. No, do you, you don't. Have, do you I have mean, a 4K TV? I, I don't. No, the TV that we got, whatever it is, we, we've got a 60-inch plasma. It's t It maxes out at 1080p. You still got that thing? Wow. No, you're, you, you're, I don't know that you've seen this one. We have a, we had a 42 inch plasma originally that we got, you know, whatever, 10 years ago or something, maybe more, but um, yeah, it was 11 years ago actually. But, uh, but then we, we upgraded in the living room, but I, I've always preferred plasma. And to be perfectly honest, uh, it, at, just the way our living rooms laid out, we really like and need sort of a wide viewing angle. And we've tried out, you know, some of the LCD TVs and stuff, and they just didn't quite cut it for, for what we needed there. So I'm hoping to go, and this was my plan. I bought like the last model year Panasonic plasma that existed and then jumped to, uh, I'm hoping 
to, to make the jump all the way to OLED, right. And skip the whole LCD LED like mess in the middle. That's, that's my goal. We'll okay. see if we'll see Which if is I what get I that. have. All right. right. So plasma, uh, based on what you've told me offers superior, I think contrast ratio. Is it, it the blacks it are blacker. Correct. And, yeah. Or can, and I think OLED, uh, Exceeds, OLED that. exceeds that correct yeah and then led may or may not right depending on yeah okay and led's got some some issues with viewing angle like like your colors right. and things change as you again it depends on the tv but as you certainly go from center to the edges and then but also like standing up and down we watch a lot of tv both on the couch but also on the floor we have a uh, fireplace kind of right there and sometimes it's nice especially when it's cold to sit by the fire and watch tv or whatever and watch a movie and there you go so uh all yep. right john you want to take us quick tip this is going to be so quick you're just going to be amazed okay all right everyone if you're a ProSoft drive genius fan i got an email from them as did many of you i'm sure drive genius 5.1 supports high sierra get it that's wow. It. That's it. <laughs> wow. As All far right. as I can tell, it does everything that your old favorite did, except it works with high Sierra and uh, especially uh, APFS. There you go. Are there so any the limitations to this? I mean, I went through it and the interface seemed to be pretty much the same. So I think they just, you know, it, it took them a, you know, a little while to upgrade it, but uh, it's one of my favorite tools. And I think one of your favorite tools for just general drive maintenance, you know, in addition to, so on the one machine I upgraded on, I didn't upgrade it on the Mini yet, but I upgraded on the MacBook Pro, and uh, it also updates the uh, 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 Drive Pulse, right? of course, which okay. is their monitoring utility, which now makes me question. Now, the other thing, of course, Drive Genius introduced recently is that they do malware stuff. So the thing is, now I'm wondering if I should be running malware bytes, which had its own bout of uh, incompatibilities. And I'm still running it on one of my machines, but I think, do I need to anymore? Because it's kind of, as far as I can tell, it's kind of built into, over, yeah, well, it's overlapping now. So yeah. the reason that I switched over to malware bytes, even though they had some RAM issues, was that Drive Genius didn't work, <laughs> including their malware detection. So, yeah. All right. I don't know well, about you. you. I, I don't know if you've. I don't run any or, of that stuff anymore. It, it slows me down. But are you running. Are, uh, or, or will you choose to run the latest Drive Genius with their malware stuff? Uh, well, no, I generally don't run Drive Pulse because it's ridiculous. Um, it wants to <laughs> yell at me. No, I, I should, I should, and I will qualify. I know it does that. for uh, for a lot of things. Uh, well, it, you know, the it, thing like, is, when I installed free space, it, it yelled, free space on it, it doesn't yes. like it. It they have, and I've talked to them about this. Uh, no, I agree with you. They're, uh, uh, Their free space calculation is out of control because it wants me to have on my SSD, it wants me to have like 40 gigs free. It's like, guys, the way an SSD works, it's not going to get less efficient at 30 gigs free than it is at 40. You know? That's, yeah. And they're like, no, we have a, they, I have a whole thing. If I'd known we were going to talk about this, I would have like gee, read. The how, how could you maybe possibly address this? Like maybe put something in the preferences saying, don't, uh, here's the low watermark that I want you to. Yeah. It won't let you set about? your own low watermark. That's right. Yeah. So it's what? 10% or whatever they, is oh, they have their own thing. Yeah. It's crazy. Or somewhere. I'm just not even going to get into it. Yeah. All right. Well, that wasn't quick. Um, it was fun. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm not saying that in a bad way. I'm just acknowledging that. Well, the goal is not to be quick. It's to well, be... well, for quick tips that you, it usually is, but again, it's like, whatever, wherever we go. Uh, Jay writes us with, uh, with a quick tip it says I was listening to episode 679 when I heard a couple of recurring questions that I might be able to answer with one submission to cool stuff found. First, the question of a notes app that will sync locally. And second, Pilot Pete's Circus Ponies notebook dilemma, because it doesn't exist. He says, I love Devin Think, but it's not for everyone. I can't remember this ever coming up on the show before. Another solution is Notebooks, which you will find at notebooksapp.com. Not only is it a handsome app with some unique features, but among syncing options is Wi-Fi sharing. And if you read the FAQs, you will find detailed instructions for migration from Circus Ponies Notebook. 
So there you go. Thanks, Jay. That's great. Awesome stuff. All right. Well, uh, you know, we had actually this question came in a couple of weeks ago, but I wanted to give it some time to uh, to fer- to ferment, John. But listener Mark wrote in and uh, and said, my confusion over people's enthusiasm for Plex remains unanswered. Some background, though. We're in a semi-rural town in Queensland, so our internet is pretty ordinary. Using the remote access of Plex, for me, he says, is not possible. So without that on the table, why Plex? I have an Apple TV 4 with a lot of compute grunt, so why would I need to find another compute resource to transcode my videos? Plex's client-server solution, of course, requires it. The client on your Apple TV doesn't do a lot of heavy lifting. It's all left up to the server which if you're running, say, a disk station, might actually be slower than your Apple TV. He says, for folks who do not need the remote access Plex element, I would recommend Infuse. This is a native Apple TV app and uses the Apple TV to do all of the transcoding. It has all the expected metadata capabilities and has run flawlessly for us for months. The free version does not support all of the video formats, i.e. MKV, but the premium version or the pro version, they call it, is well priced. It is. It's uh, I think you can pay six bucks a year for it or maybe it's more than that, uh, but it or fifteen dollars flat rate. And then you own it, depending on which way you want to buy it from the app store. So this sort of opened up some thought process for me because one of the problems I have, and it doesn't matter whether it's Plex or or video station, if I'm watching a movie that I'm streaming from a box over there that's transcoding it for me. And I need to like rewind or fast forward or scrub around in it. Sometimes that works flawlessly. And sometimes it stops the movie dead in its tracks because, you know, you're asking this box over there to start transcoding this section. Oh, no, no, stop. Transcode this section. Oh, no, stop. Right. And then that gets wonky because you've got this server that's sort of disconnected from the client. With Infuse, it's all happening locally. You just point Infuse at your local library that's like file shared. It's got a SMB client in it. And then it goes through and it indexes all the metadata for your movies. So for the last couple of weeks, most of the time that we watch movies at home, anything from our, our private collection, uh, we watch, we've watched with Infuse and it has been great. It's got a really nice interface. It's got, um, you know, it's got, album art and all the metadata and everything you don't get all the trailers and additional you know behind the scenes commentary and all that stuff that plex tends to deliver you infuse doesn't do any of that it's just about the movies that you have but it works really well and it's a really smooth thing i feel like i tried it a number of years ago and it was like okay but not not ready for prime time well it's definitely ready for prime time now so i wanted to i wanted to share that from uh from Mark, I have another thing to share on that front, John, but I'll let you, uh, I'll, I'll throw it to you. Any questions, thoughts? Well, the, the thought I had, so we're talking about previews and just the, the viewing experience. The one thing I noticed, uh, in addition to, you know, my handbrake fail, which I fixed, is that when it's it's scanning a title, a lot of times it'll say scanning previews. And I think what it's doing there is it's trying, it's putting additional information in the RIP well, that, make it so that that's your not is... that's not previews, like that's not trailers and such, right? No, Plex? I understand that. Yeah, okay. no preview. I, 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 from what I get, it, it's a preview in the sense that if you jump to a different part of the movie, it's going to show you a thumbnail at the very least. Right? Oh yeah, I, yes. There's some of that it, it, it can be baked into the movie. You, you know, I got to be honest though. I have completely stopped uh, converting movies at all. I rip like, you know, with um, generally with make MKV for Blu-rays and it makes an MKV file because that's what make MKV does. And then that's it. I just put the MKV and the VOBs and all this stuff from the subtitles and whatever in a folder for the movie. And I it works great because I get well, because I'm not I'm not losing any quality. I'm keeping, you know, full quality on my library. Storage is cheap and uh and then there you go. It's just right there. Good to go. 
and 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 infuse or plex or whatever i want to use can transcode it on the fly but it gets even more interesting you know john whoa well hit me i'd heard a lot about this company called playon.tv and i started playing with it no pun intended it's a weird thing you can through this service get undrm'd video files of your favorite netflix episodes hulu hbo now hbo go all those things that generally you don't get to do that with and what you do is you tell it okay this is what i want to get from my hbo account go and it'll say all right we're gonna like it literally says this in the app we're gonna go and have a computer watch that video and, and save what it sees and then it's going to put that in a file for you that uh, that will give you a link to download. Kind of sounds like a DVR. It's kind of like a DVR. Yeah. <laughs> a virtual DVR. Exactly. It's like, All right. I'm going it's to like, it's, well, content. it's no different than like, you know, Xfinity's X1 cloud DVR, right? It's the same sort of concept implemented differently for sure. But um, but it works. And then you buy credits you get your first credit for free just for signing up, but then you buy credits. And I think they're like, you know, 30 cents or something for a credit to get it to go and, and go do a, a job for you. I, it, I, it seems, I don't know. Like I, I'm, I'm assuming they've sorted out whatever licensing issues they would need to. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you think. No, that's what I choose to think. John. <laughs> There's a difference. Uh, in the same vein, while we're talking about video playback, Leslie wrote us and, uh, and started me down a different path, John. And it's not necessarily one that's been easy, but Leslie, My son, you should probably only choose one path. Yes. If you're on a discovery journey, then I encourage multiple paths. Go, okay. Go. Well, this was a discovery journey. My, my life is a discovery journey, John. You know that, uh, <laughs> For all of us. It's For all like, of us, yeah. Or it uh, should be. Leslie wrote, do either of you have the new TiVo Vox remote? You have to, If you do, you have to update your TiVo service from TiVo Central, which is the user interface that TiVo's had basically forever, to the new TiVo Experience, which is the, uh, the name of this completely rethought user experience that TiVo now has. And Leslie finished by saying the changes are jarring and now it takes more clicks to do just about everything. So I did. I, you know, I figured ahead of CES, I'm going to meet with the TiVo folks there. I should have a working knowledge of TiVo experience. Sure. We cover it enough on this show. You know, it's certainly a recurring topic and it has been for 12 years. So, yeah, so I did it. I don't have one of their Vox remotes. Uh, I've experienced that and, and I can see where their Vox remotes would possibly make this better by simply skipping you over many of the more tedious aspects uh, and elements of the new UX. But Leslie's right. I've been using it for about two weeks now and I'm used to it. I'm over the change resistance, but I'm not comfortable yet. It, it's, it's clunky. The new UX, I think it almost requires voice as opposed to, you know, voice would enhance it. It, it, I don't know. It seems kind of weird. A lot of extra clicks, but it's where we will all be with our TiVos soon. So at some point, not if I have anything to say about it, because they made a very minor change to their UI on my bolt, Dave, mm -hmm. and that they moved something from one place to another. And it's like, why did you do that? Yeah. I think it was like where to find, you know, my to do list or something, but, but they reshuffled. The UI for no, as far as I can tell, beneficial reason to me, because it may be sad because I'm like, well, wait, this used to be here. What what happened? Why did you move it? And if there was no that, explanation. If that, just bothered, like, if that bothered you, I, I, I have then to this tell would you, add, you gonna, then I'm going to jump. Yeah, I'm going to jump. You're going to lose. Window, you're right? going to lose containment when when you change to this <laughs> other thing. But I'm just tell, I'm just warning as a friend. I'm telling you. No, I like, understand. Be ready. I understand. But just them making uh, don't ever make a UI change without warning people, especially with a product that 
is you know, all about TiVo, UI. dude. Yeah. I mean, two, dude. I mean, TiVo, their their reason for success is because their UI was so accessible to so many people. I mean, even my, you know, non tech parents yeah. and my sister get TiVo. So when you introduce a change without warning people, it's it's traumatic. This is so. gonna rock their world. It, like I may, we've, try, we've I may t- try it. I mean, I can you handle cannot the trauma, go back. but it's like you cannot go back. Well, that I don't like. I mean, it's like, oh no, wait. Yeah, I, I take I, that back. I take that back. You can go back, but okay. in order to do it, you have to wipe out your entire thing and lose all your recordings. Which, eh, you know, right. the recordings. I mean, I I store typically five versions of whatever show I watch. Sure. And I hardly ever rewatch them. It's just kind of a safety net in case I need to look back like, oh, that was that thing in that episode. But I could probably handle that. Yeah. Um, so there you go. Or back it up on an external source, which, you know, is kind of craziness. But uh, yeah, well, yeah, they and they like that stuff isn't quite in the new UI. You can't send videos back to it yet. It's not a uh, permanent omission. It's just, you know. Right. It, yeah. And add one thing here, which just I thought I'd mention because it's in front of me right now. A lot of things you can't pull off the TiVo. So I'm running right now. Right. But that's what Playon is for, man. The thing is, I don't want to take a, I don't want to deviate. Well, no, I'm, I already have. But the thing is, so I'm, I'm I'm running C TiVo right now, which I think is probably one of the better clients for the Mac. Yeah. We're talking about pieces of software that'll let you take the things that your TiVo has recorded and pull them off so that you could use them on like your, you know, whatever your Mac or wherever you want. Yeah. Of course the thing is or not because several recordings with uh, HD content uh, are marked as copyrighted or copy protected. Right. And at least see TiVo honors that it's like, well, yeah, this is on your TiVo, but I'm not going to let you download it because it has this flag set. And I'm like, "Mm, all right. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I actually, if, if you're in that boat, I, I highly recommend like I used, we used to do the whole CTVO thing and, and all that, uh, that was very short lived because once we got the TiVo bolt and I think your Romeo will do this too. It'll, you can just have, oh, no, I got the bolt. I got the bolt. Oh, that's right. The bolt plus. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yours is, is, is uh, newer than ours, but, um, you can just stream directly to your iPad or your iPhone. Right from your TiVo. You can even stream live TV. It doesn't matter where you are. So that like that obviated the need for a CTVO for us because it's just like, okay, great. We can just do whatever we want. It's cool. Well, to me, a lot of times if I miss something, the thing is I found more often than not, if it's a, you know, a big show. Yeah. You can stream it on the web for free anyways. Yes. And so a lot of times if I miss something and this still makes me shake my fist, but if my TiVo for whatever reason misses something like my cable network is down, which has happened. Sure. Um, I stream it online and I send it to my Apple TV and I get it in HD and everything's good though. I have to watch commercials, but you know, that's life. That's life. Yeah, exactly. That's what all the people say. Hey, uh, (laughs) (laughs) you know what all the people also say, John? Well, I don't know if all the people say this, but what I say is our first sponsor for this episode is otherworld computing at maxsales.com or now, OWCdigital.com seems like the same. I mean, it's they all go basically to the same place. So, uh, seems like they're transitioning to that. I, that wow, I are they digital? digital. They've awesome. been digital for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> well, and and they've been one of my favorite companies for a long time. And the good news is they don't have to pay me to say that. Uh, though I am happy to say it. They it, they are the place that I will go first if I need to buy an external whatever for my Mac. Like if there's something that Apple doesn't make, or even sometimes if Apple makes it, but you know, somebody else could make it and make it better. Uh, any attachment for my Mac, OWC is the first place that I go to look for like solving whatever that need is because they just sort of, that's what, that's where their heads are is how can they make from a hardware standpoint, how can they make your Mac experience better? Kind of, they're kind of like the perfect match for us. And I, and I, I, I don't say that, uh, like I think they do great stuff, but like here we are trying to make your Macs better from sort of a software standpoint and sort of a, a conceptual standpoint is what we do here. Well, they provide the hardware to make that happen. So it is a perfect fit. They have two things that I want to talk about quickly here. The first is their USB-C travel dock. If you've got a USB-C Mac, 
here's this, it's kind of like a little square, almost puck sized thing plugs in USB C. It's got a USB three gen one port on one side, uh, sorry, USB 3.1 gen one port on one side. It's got another one of those on the other side, HDMI SD card reader, and then another USB C type, uh, a USB C auxiliary port where you can deliver power, right? So there you go. It's cool. The other thing is their Aura Pro 10 SSDs for all of those Macs where the SSDs are on a board inside it. They've got kits to do it. Everything now is designed for and, of course, compatible with High Sierra, taking full advantage of APFS and all of those features. You got to check it out. Go to Otherworld Computing, OWCDigital.com, MacSales.com, either one, take you there. Our thanks to Otherworld Computing for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, we got all kinds of questions. I don't know which direction we're going to go on this, but let's start with Mark's question. And Mark, oh, I got, we've had so many Marks in here. It's crazy, crazy. It's the show of all Marks. Uh, writes, I'm having an issue with my fiance's iPhone, and I'm hoping you guys can point me in the right direction. For some reason, when she gets a text message or an iMessage, the notification disappears from the lock screen. It only seems to happen for messages. Other notifications still show up and stick around. When she gets a message, it shows up initially, but then goes away after some amount of time. I've checked the relevant notification settings and they appear correct and they match the settings on my iPhone. The issue has persisted across a new phone. However, it was restored from a backup of the old phone. So here's the thing that makes messages different from most other apps that deliver you notifications. Messages notifications are what I call smart in that once you've read that message, even if you've read it on another device, the notification goes away. If it's not an unread message, it doesn't live in your notif in your notification center. So the question is, is there another device on which she or someone, if we're going to wear our tinfoil hats, is reading those messages? If she has an Apple Watch, that could do it. If she has an iPad or a Mac where she's reading those messages, that could do it. Potentially, her Mac could do it without her there if she had messages open on that particular thread and the Mac were awake it might get itself in a scenario where that could be assumed that it was read and then it disappears. Any thoughts on this, John? I mean, I've seen similar and I'm wondering if some of this, Dave, is related to your iCloud account. Do you see where I'm yeah, going well, this? I mean, certainly messages is, is absolutely a part of, uh, well, it's part right, of your Apple that, ID. On my various yeah. devices, yeah, right. I will get messages. Um, through the message, I'm, you know, I got some from you today, you know, we're saying, you know, do this for the show, do that, you know, check this out. And I'm like, yeah, cool. <sighs> but I'm trying to remember. No, I don't think I'm going to offer it. But the thing is, it's it, it, the, the nature of that has never bothered me. But the thing is, I've never noticed that the alerts have not appeared on my other. Right. iCloud enabled devices. So that that's actually kind of so maybe the process here is that if you acknowledge this on one device then it wipes it because it thinks it's doing something good for you i don't know maybe yeah yeah I mean, um for there the most is, part i've there... noticed when i get alerts or messages you know especially when they come from messages like you know you sent me a couple today they appeared on all of my devices sure because i selected that in um well, of course, you can select that in iCloud. You know, it's buried somewhere. But the thing is, if you're everybody's logged into iCloud, you can have your your messages propagate among all the devices. Oh, that's which what they may do. Be good or yeah. may be bad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It 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 could be this other thing. Warren in the chat room at macgeekab.com slash stream says uh, if you visit on your iOS devices, notif uh, settings, notifications, messages. There is a temporary or persistent option where if you have it set to persistent, once a message comes in, 
into notification center at the top, it stays there. It won't go away until you actively dismiss it. Whereas temporary, it shows up. And then after a short period of time, it, it fades away, but it's still there. If you swipe down into notification center, either way, or at least it should be if it's remaining on red. So, all right. Well, if anybody has any thoughts, let us know feedback at MacGeekGab.com. So there are some nuances to the whole messaging thing, Dave, but I just want to make sure that I heard what you said. And that was feedback at MacGeekGab.com. It is feedback at MacGeekGab.com. Unless you want to find us on Twitter. And Peter actually has a question about Twitter because things have been changing over there. And Peter says, Twitter now allows 280 characters per tweet, but the share menu of Mac OS only allows 140. Is there any way to update that? So, yeah, I, I've, I've noticed that there is a way to update that. And now I'm going to be a little bit snarky, uh, but only if you're an Apple engineer, uh, I think. Uh, I no, mean, shake your fist, man, because they deserve this. Well, so Twitter's I like, think they deserve what you're going to say, but uh, I'm sorry. Go. Well, it, if you think of a of Mac OS as yet another Twitter client, which it is right. It's just another piece of software that can interface with Twitter without you, you know, going to twitter.com on, on the website. Of course you could do that too, but the share menu is just another Twitter client and every Twitter client needs to be updated to support 280 characters. They've updated their iOS apps. Twitter has Twitter has not updated their Mac OS app. Their native Mac OS app is still stuck at 140 characters. Apple has not yet updated Sierra or High Sierra, the Twitter client components of those, to for shame. For shame. Well, I mean, it's only been a couple of weeks, right? <laughs> I, I, well, no, seriously. I mean, I, I would not expect Apple to prioritize that in an OS update the way, I mean, the cycle at which OS updates happen at Apple is, uh, you know, things are cemented in and then they're QA'd and then they're sent out. And sure, we could sit and argue that in theory, th lately their QA <laughs> process has been a little, you know, less robust, but, um, but you know, like this would not be something that, if I were the project manager of, of Mac OS where I'd be saying, Oh, we must get that in there. I think they will eventually. I, I mean, but I can't say for sure, obviously, but I think they will eventually, but I think it'll probably be, you know, January, February before that, that change is rolled out there. Now, whether or not Twitter is ever going to update their own Mac OS app to support this is sort of the, the big, you know, that's the, well, I guess I was going to say it's a million dollar question, but it's not. It's just a twenty dollar question, right? Because I could buy Twitterific for twenty bucks on the Mac and get that feature. Is that right? I did. <laughs> is that what it is? Is it twenty bucks for Twitterific on the Mac? Uh, Nineteen ninety nine. Yeah. Okay. So you save a penny there. So so you get that penny there. But um, you know, D Dave is someone who has done software and someone who, you know, I still consider myself a software engineer. Yeah. This is just a poor design because the thing is if you change the length of a message within a protocol the client the, the protocol between the client and the server should be able to adapt to that you shouldn't have to come out with a new version so i i'm not getting why some things don't work i mean did they hard code in the twitter client on mac 140 characters maybe they've they hard coded i don't know well they've hard coded that into every twitter client everywhere because yeah. because the they have is, to you, warn you, you when you get mm -hmm. to that limit. Right? I mean, the whole size of the UI. Yeah, I get everything. it. No, yeah. uh, but do, do you see where I'm going here? Is that you can make that kind of dynamic and part of the protocol is like, well. But it's that's the thing is it's not part of the protocol. It was it was always 140 characters. And so right. Twitter was never like when you authenticate with Twitter, it doesn't say. And hey, uh, our character limit for today is 140 characters. Like that's not part right. of the handshake. What I'm saying it's is not it, a, it, it right? should be transparent. I think it is. The client should say, what's the biggest size you can take? And it's like, here, here it is. And the client's like, okay, cool. 
Yeah, you but know? that that's what I'm saying is that was never built into the API. Right. And because oh, well. it was 140 characters. So, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I this this couldn't have been written to be dynamic given by any app developer because Twitter's API doesn't expose that. Okay. I'll accept that. It's a fault of the API, but you know, the thing is, I mean, you see what I'm saying? You can pull it off easily. If it's there in the API, but, but I mean, you you'd be asking Twitter to predict the, you know, the future 10 years down the road saying, are we ever Eh. going to change this are we ever going to change that are we ever going to change this i'd have to pull back on that it's like tcp ip it's like all right how many pieces of data do you have um i have this much okay send it sure and ipv6 was, was no. just automatic huh <laughs> i mean <laughs> right, right like you they, there's certain givens that you just have to be able to uh, to, to have everyone assume personally uh, no i get it per- personally yeah. i don't think it should have ever been an issue if their original design intent was to have a flexible message size, but apparently that was not one of their that was never design their, intents. No, their design intent was exactly the opposite. Was fixed message. Well, it size. was we want to be SMS like. We want to correct fit into an SMS size, so yeah. we're going to hard code it. Which right, hard coded. Yeah. Almost anyway, was not a good decision. Anyway, moving on. Twitterific for Mac OS will support that, and uh, and there you go. Uh, I alluded to this earlier, John. Joe writes in and asks, he says, I'm battling a high Sierra install, having some issues with causing system pauses. Not really hangs, though occasionally it will get to the spinning rainbow. Uh, He says opening activity monitor will occasionally show that BDL Damon is using a lot of CPU and I notice frequently software update D is as well, at least briefly. Interestingly, often background windows activity monitor, for instance, will continue to have screen changes, but windows are frozen and sometimes the mouse freezes as well with the spinning rainbow. The pause is anywhere from 20 to 60 seconds and the frequency is about every five to 15 minutes. And he goes on to talk about a few other things. Uh, he says, uh, the CPU use seems to grind to zero rather than being tied up. Uh, but yet I still can't do anything with the system. So this is an interesting thing. Um, we've all experienced things like this. Some of us more frequently than others. Every one of these is going to be uh, potentially unique in his case, BDL demon or Damon uh, is a piece of Bitdefender's antivirus for the Mac. Antivirus software, by its nature, gets in your way. It's scanning everything that's happening. Uh, if you've got some app that's doing a big index somewhere, maybe Dropbox even, like those two things can sort of, you know, create a perfect storm together because Dropbox is indexing. And as Dropbox is reading stuff, Bitdefender's in there, reading right along with it, the same files, making sure everything's okay. And it can, it can sort of swirl up and, and it can cause problems like that. I don't run antivirus software on my Macs for this very reason. And it's what we were talking about before. Uh, But, uh, you know, there are plenty of proof of concept pieces of malware out there. So, you know, you got to pick your, your place on that, risk continuum but um but I, my advice if you want that to go away is to turn off bit defender and you know live with that i do have more to add to this a completely different direction in fact john but i'll, I'll throw it to you first my only reflection is that um so we did um you may recall dave we we did look at a uh a bit defender product recently or i did Oh yeah, uh, their oh. box product, right? Which included the uh, uh, Bitdefender software, and I noted as well that it seemed to suck down the suck down the uh, processor. Yeah. Um, the good news, um, which we will report the results when it happens, is that they introduced a new version of both their hardware and software, which will hopefully uh, alleviate these problems. Which I 
pointed out to them in not so <laughs> subtle terms. I'm like, dude, it's sucking my processor. So um, we'll see if they can uh, improve. The, the, it sounds like they, they are on the road to improving uh, the performance of their uh, Daemon, which I noticed, and, uh, and both their box. So uh, stay tuned. Yeah, it, it really. I didn't want to make this about Bit Defender. I, I mean, it, the the no, it's a general. Point but that's though, it. It's just a gen. Yeah, and and the way Joe went about this was right. When your system slows down, if you can launch Activity Monitor, see what's going on. If that's not giving you any indication, launch Console. Maybe see what's going on there. I um. In general, my 2011 MacBook Air has been performing actually very, very well uh, with high Sierra, much better than it ever did with, with Sierra. But there are times when it sort of gets itself tied in a knot. There are two processes, spin dump and tailspin D. These are Apple processes that monitor your system. If an app tells one of them to take a sample of what's going on, they certainly will, but otherwise they sort of sit there and aren't triggered unless one app starts using a lot of CPU. And then it fires up these processes to take a sample of that uh, so that, you know, there's some history of what happened when, and when this app sort of took over. The problem is that spin dump and tail spin D use quite a bit of CPU on their own uh, yeah. to do this. So if you've got an app that's been using a lot of CPU correctly or incorrectly, and then spin dump decides, Hey, that app's been using the CPU pretty heavily for a minute, maybe a minute and a half. I'm going to fire up a process and I'm going to sample the heck out of that thing. Suddenly you now have three processes competing for your system resources. You've got the one, and then you've got spin dump and tail spin D. These are two things that fire up from Apple. So I set about figuring out and I've looked at the logs that these things spit out and they're, you know, generally worthless for me. They just tell me, yeah, this one process got really gung ho. It's like, well, yeah, I know. And then you got in its way to tell me that this process was gung ho. Didn't want that. So uh, I did some digging, John, and I found you could do this manually, but I found a, a, a script on GitHub that basically what it does is it goes into both system library launch agents and system library launch demons, launch demons, whatever you want, and renames plist files in there uh, after it unloads them. So it turns them off and then it, it renames them so that they can't come back. Uh, I presume an OS update would would sort of. Uh, you know, require you to run all this again. The, I'll put a link to these scripts in the show notes, but I, I got to warn you, these scripts, if used by default, will probably turn off things that you really want to have on. Uh, they, they're they sort of built to turn off all of Apple's background stuff. And you might want, say, screen sharing on, or maybe you want photo analysis D to run. All these things, it's going to try and turn them off because they've just sort of put them in there by default. But uh, so I went through and I, I sort of stripped these things out except for com.apple.spindumpd.plist or com. And then com.apple.tailspind. I guess it's not spin dump D it's just spin dump and then tailspind. D. And uh, I had to disable system integrity protection for this script to run because you're modifying system files and, that's what system integrity protection is there to, to prevent. So you, you would, you know, disable SIP, which you have to do in recovery mode. And then you boot into recovery mode, you launch the terminal and you type CSR util space disable, and then it turns it off. And then you go run this, you got to reboot back in, then you go run this script, then you come back around and, and you can turn system integrity protection back on, back on once you've disabled this stuff. But now when I wake up my MacBook Air, it just wakes up. And there's not like there's processes that fire off and do their thing, but spin dump and tailspin aren't trying to like log every one of them. Um, it used to take 10 minutes for spin dump and tailspin to finish sometimes after I would wake up my Mac. And, and that's now a thing of the past for me. So, so I've, I've put a link, I'll put a link in the show notes for, for this. I put it in our chat room too, but beware, beware, but it, 
I, I think it's a good thing. I don't need those things running. I don't think. What do you think, John? What I think is in general is you, you should have some tool, either activity monitor or my favorite, Dave, is I stat menus. Yeah. So when your system is slowing down, you can identify where the heck is it happening? Because a lot of oh, times yeah. it's not entirely obvious. It well, could that's, be, that's how I got here, right? I mean, it, yeah. Th- yeah. It could be your disk. Exactly it that. could be your RAM. It could be your, uh, it could be one of several things, but these tools will help you identify it because I still got to say when, especially from, you know, wherever the request comes from, when I hear, the statement, my system is slow. I, I, my blood starts to boil because the thing is, you got to quantify that. Right. Right. And most of our listeners do that in that they're like, well, you know, it happens here and there like this. Yeah. But um, if you can get a tool to measure the phenomenon that helps us and it helps you and it helps everybody and it makes right. the world a better place. Right. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, Don had an interesting, while we're on, you know, kind of doing the movie episode here, Don said random M4V and JPEG files on two spinning hard drives attacked, attached to my iMac via type one Thunderbolt connections have become unreadable. The discs are readable. Just some of these files are not. It says, unfortunately, this corruption is spread to all of my available backups, time machine, backblaze and crash plan. As I said, this has affected only some files. For example, half of the M4V files in a folder containing a season of a television program are corrupted while the others are totally fine. I've run Disk Utility and Disk Warrior and Drive Genius. Nothing has helped. Fortunately, I have the original media, the Blu-rays and the DVDs for all my corrupt M4Vs. But and and good news, none of the corrupt JPEGs were important. My first question is whether either of you know anything that might repair these unreadable files. My second is whether either of you could hazard a guess about the cause um, uh, he says, finally, I know that an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. I'd thought my backblaze crash plan and time machine backups would have prevented my being caught. Alas, this wasn't the case. The earliest available versions of these files on the three backups are unreadable as well. This is interesting, right? Because certainly bit rot can happen. Um, if you've got a drive that's slowly going bad, you may not, especially with like movies and, and pictures, things that you're not accessing all the time. You may not know that you've got any data issues or any physical issues with the drive whatsoever because, and, right? Well, I want to help identify the term that you use, bit rot. Mm. So bit rot is, let's uh, talk about this here. So you have storage and you write data to it and you read data from it. And your assumption is that the data that you write and you later read, is the same. I think bit rot is a term that we IT veterans use to say that something in the data has changed state without you making that happen. And that it could be, cause. and, and I'm, I'm totally serious here, cosmic rays, um, magnetic forces, electrical forces, or just the drives themselves. Things change state on media. And you may do nothing to cause this. So right. um, the idea, uh, I, I guess the, the I'm trying to project the thought here is that, number one, the fact that something is degrading or changing state and you don't know about it is disturbing. And what can you do about it? Well, the, um, the, the interesting part here, though, is that the backups were made. I mean, usually when you've got, you know, data degradation, a.k.a. bit rot. Right. You've got a scenario where the file is at least partially unreadable, right? I mean, but, but backup software has to read individual files. It doesn't have to, but that's how those three pieces of backup software work. They all read individual files and then make copies of them. So how did the damaged files make it into the backups? Like that's the part to me that, um, Like if they're unreadable now, how did they get unreadable into the backups? Well, I guess that was kind of what I was going for is that the thing is, if the contents of a file become inconsistent with the 
parameters of that type of file, who's going to warn you about that? And right. my, my thought, and you know, we may be going on an irrelevant tangent, though I think not. I think it's a relevant one. But you know, things like RAID and you know, various technologies that are used to verify the integrity of the data on your hard drive could have detected this. So at some point in time, I'm sure with these files, when the 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 rot or the change in the format of the data occurred, somebody could have said or fixed the problem. Do you see where I'm going here? Right. Right. And yes, I because just... that didn't happen. But but the and, and the thing is, even now, I mean, we, we discussed this time machine does have a checksum for files. It, it stores a checksum and you can do a verification. Uh, as of late, I, 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 I forgot. I, I think it was one or two versions ago where Time Machine would do this. So even that should have alerted you to the fact that something has changed. Yeah. If you actively tried to find this problem. But um, it, I'm still just, just trying to swirl around the problem of how do you detect when a file has degraded? Now, you could do it. And I've seen some products, Dave. Uh, we haven't used them much. I, I've certainly never used them. Where they can actually do a checksum on all the files on your hard drive. And if anything changes, they'll say, hey, you know, something's wrong here. But um, that's not typical practice, at least for the current version of Mac OS. And I don't think most operating systems, right? Right, right. Yeah, it's weird. It's I. So how I, do you how do how do you know? Uh, to me, the big question, and we'll throw it out to the uh, you know I, I affectionately call the peanut gallery. Everybody who's listening is how do you tell when your files have started to degrade or lose their integrity? And that's a uh, it's a big problem for all of us, right? Yeah, yeah. It's interesting, and you know, it's why. Uh, a lot of raid units and I use, you know, uh, and a lot of NAS units, but raid units too, will do data scrubbing or tell you to do data scrubbing on, uh, on the drives where it basically My goes Synology through. every month. And I appreciate the fact they do this says, you know, we need to do this sort of thing because now I, I don't know about you, Dave, I've never had mine come up with a inconsistency or maybe it fixes it and doesn't tell you about it, but at least Synology uh, encourages you to do this operation to make sure the data is consistent. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, Drobos do it automatically. They don't even tell you that they're doing it. It just, it just happens. But every, every NAS, QNAP, Synology, Drobo, they all do this thing where they read through the drive and make sure it's going to be, uh, the data is readable because they know that they are, they're not cold storage devices, but a lot of the data that you put there, you just leave and you're not routinely reading. So that's what this data scrubbing is. It's like, no, nope, you know what? Let's routinely read it just to make sure we, we don't have a bigger problem developing. And it's smart. So, yeah. Very interesting. All right. Um, now, we did have... But I just want to mention, so in the chat room here, which, uh, did we talk about the chat room, Dave? We did. At com slash stream. But um, some people actually mentioned, and actually I'll, uh, I'll, I'll throw my tin hat in the ring here. <laughs> um, memory may get corrupted, in which case you read a file, memory gets corrupted, and then you write it out, and you write out bogus data. Um. If that wouldn't it's corrupt. Right. That wouldn't do it. No, because it, it like that. You're not rewriting the file on the source disk. It, it like the file got corrupted there. And then I saw that comment in the chat room, but, but it doesn't make sense. Right. Because you're not um, like that would mean that the data on the backup is different from the data on the source drive. But it sounds like in this case, they're both the same. It's gotten the damaged data. It's just weird that a backup, like that none of these backup packages caught the fact that they were having trouble reading this data. That's where it gets kind of wonky to me. Yeah. So I, I, I mean, I get the memory argument to a certain extent. So our friend Brian made this, but um, you know, what if you read data and you don't have ECC memory? So ECC is error correction code, I think. And I think typically Mac systems do not use the ECC feature of RAM. They just, Right. Yeah, that's just read. again. It's just. I mean, we're talking about bit rot 
ECC memory, I don't think it fits into this conversation. Uh, I think it fits into a, a potential source of corruption, but yeah, no, I'm kind of with you. I mean, I just I like, unless you're reading from the, the disc and writing back to it, I don't see how the type of RAM that you have could, could cause this. Okay. I guess yeah. the key thing is, you know, what is the source of the corruption, I guess, is, is the mm-hmm. mystery mm-hmm. that we are all dealing with. And it's like, it could be bad RAM. It could be a bad hard drive. Well, yeah, it's a bad hard drive. I, I don't think, I don't want to send people on wild goose chases. I don't think it's bad RAM. I, I am certain, in fact, that okay. it's a bad hard drive. The question is, how did it well, yeah. get from the bad hard drive to the backups? And that's, that's what we don't know. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that, right. that's what BitRot is, right? Is it, the data is going bad on the storage. So, yeah. Hey, um, Warren had, uh, had, well, he had an interesting question again over on our Facebook yeah. group, MacGeekUp.com slash Facebook. Um, we were talking about mesh networks and Wi-Fi and all of that. And Warren commented, he said, let me know. Uh, when one of these mesh networks can match my FIOS gigabit speeds, which is, of course, a thousand megabits, give or take. Uh, and I believe with FIOS, he gets it not only on the downstream, but back on the upstream. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, but what I was weep. what what um, what he's looking for is and I have no trouble getting gigabit speeds out of most of these things that I test. But when I say that, I mean that I have no trouble on ethernet getting gigabit speeds across from the things on my LAN on my local network to my WAN Um, where you're not going to get gigabit speeds is with Wi-Fi. And I know that there are routers out there. In fact, Warren even posted a picture of one, the, uh, the Netgear Nighthawk X, 6s the 8r8000p 8, router says it's a 4 gigabit wi-fi router so let's talk about how router speeds are marketed router speeds are marketed as the speed of the the maximum theoretical speed of each radio inside your router added together so that means if like in the case of this router you have a tri-band router you have one 2.4 gigahertz band and two 5 gigahertz bands, three different radios in there for this. The 2.4 gigahertz band, I guess, is a 5 by 5 radio. I don't quite understand that. I've never seen that before, but it's that would be 750 megabits per second. And then each of the 5 gigahertz radios, because of the number of streams they have, are each 600 or sorry, 1,625. So you add 1625 plus 1625 plus 750. And you know, there you go. There's four gigabits. But here's the thing. There are no client devices that are going to connect to all three radios simultaneously and bridge a connection across them. And your router is really not set up to accept a client like that. But that's okay because as I said, those clients don't exist. Certainly not in consumer applications. So we're limited really by the speed of our client devices and almost every device you get from Apple is either a one by one or more commonly a two by two Wi-Fi device. And what that means is the number of streams that can go in each direction. So a two by two device has two streams for sending and two for receiving two streams on one radio, two streams of 802.11ac, which is the fast standard that we have on five gigahertz now, each of those streams can theoretically go 433 megabits per second. So add them together, you get 866. And then guess what? Divide it by two to get the realistic maximum, not the theoretical maximum. And you get somewhere about 400 megabits per second if you're close to the router and don't have any interference. That's the fastest that your clients can do. I believe the IMAX and I know the new MacBook Pros have three by three radios. So 433 times three is 1300. Cut that in half and you get your, you know, you're going to get probably about 600 megabits per second out of those things, maybe seven. 
uh, again, in perfect scenario, you're still not going to hit gigabit speeds. But again, it's all up to your clients. Your iPhone will never do gigabit Wi-Fi because it literally doesn't have enough radio in it to do that. And that's where things get a little confusing sometimes. So, yes, most of the mesh products out there are built for gigabit speeds with Ethernet. No, they're not built for gigabit speeds with Wi-Fi because neither are your client devices. So there you go. Did I get that right, John? As far as I can tell, cool. I just look forward to the future. But uh, yeah, I think in general, your statement that Wi-Fi speeds will probably never approach well, wired speeds is correct because there's so many variables. Right. I think someday we will see Wi-Fi speeds eclipse what most people are able to do for wired speeds. Uh, I doubt it. I, th I think in the home, I think so. I mean, in many cases, we're already there, right? Because a lot of people can't send gigabit Ethernet throughout their homes. Well, to me, though, the, see, the problem is that with enough power and enough uh, frequency, you can do anything. The thing right. Is, is the power and the frequency required to get gigabit speeds from wireless devices worth the threat to your, your well-being and health and life? But, well, there's that, uh, there's that whole why max thing, right? Isn't that the one that goes like, no, 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 that, that, um, that's getting, isn't that, oh no, there was, there was a, it's not why max. It's the other one. I can't remember. 802.11 AD. A, no, is it AD? Is that what it, is that what AD I'm thinking of? Is, AD is purportedly close to gigabit Wi-Fi that, and I think it's on a weird band, like some. I forget. It's some weird frequency that I'm like, what are you doing? It's the there? 60 but, um, gigahertz spectrum. I think. Yeah. Is where 60 gig. Lives. Yeah. And I'm like, what? But I think you go there. I think it'll, I think it'll do multi gigabit is what it's built to do. Well, I guess it could. It yeah. doesn't kill you first, but um, we're going to learn about that at CES. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure you're right. Yeah. Why, we already why saw why it last year. We, what Brian. I mean, yeah. we already saw, I mean, I, I was with the TP link guys and they were like, yeah, here's our, you know, next gen product. And, uh, yeah, it's got the crazy, crazy frequency and crazy throughput. And I'm like, hey, cool. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing is higher frequencies mean that in general, unless you jack the power up, your distance is going to be limited. Right. So that's just my right. worry. Oh, is no. That, are gonna, e yeah. This... Are we going to fry our brains in, in, in order to get higher bandwidth on our on our toys? And yeah, absolutely. We will. It. No, we all think it's worth it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, Where are we at? Let's see. It, it, Abel, again, also from Facebook. We had some great stuff on Facebook this week. Uh, let's see. Abel bought a new switch, a TP-Link switch, actually. And it was one of those smart switches. And he said he had all kinds of problems. When he introduced it into his network, he was getting packet loss. Uh, it caused his work VPN to drop. Uh, and he said he didn't do any configuration. He assumed the defaults were OK. And he asked, did anybody have any trouble? He dug into it a little more deeply and realized that the switch was giving itself an IP address that was in use by another device. I think Abel's router on his network. Uh, he said the documentation of the switch said that it was set to 192.168.1.1. Turns out the switch was set to 192.168.0.1. And that was the same address that his router had chosen for itself whenever he set that up. And therefore, the uh, the two devices were trying to claim all the same packets. And that's not a good thing. That's not how things work well. So it it's just a reminder to anybody that goes from using dumb switches to smart switches or anybody that has smart switches that these things need an IP address on the network too. That's generally how they're configured and addressed. And so just, you know, just remember. So thanks for that, Abel. Sorry you had to go through it, but thank you for sharing so that the rest of us can remember this when we get there. It's good stuff. Yes, Mr. Braun. Well, I, I found it interesting because I would think some device on the network, like your router would warn you when another device tries to claim the same IP address. 
And actually, even even further. Wait, wait, wait. Slow down. I'm going to ask you this question. How? Yes. How would your router warn you of this? Uh... I mean, your Mac can tell you like if you're if some if another device is uh, is is, you know, using or trying to use the same IP address as your Mac, your Mac will actually throw up an error message and say, right, the device at this Mac address is trying to use uh, this IP address. But I mean, if you don't have a display Good. on your router. No, excellent point. And if your router is set up so it has your email address and can send you alerts and stuff like that. Depending yeah, on the it smart router. It couldn't send you an alert if it's got if it's something's trying to use its IP address. Can't talk yeah, on the network. Unless it goes to the internet, which it's probably connected to. But no, oh, no, I, see I get what you're your saying. Point. Oh yeah, the router does have the other right, right, right. It could try and do it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's good. But it's um no, it's a good point. Is that again, I would think that a uh, you know, most operating systems and routers and other pieces of equipment, if they see somebody else trying to claim their address, will try to cry for help. Now, it may not always get to you. Right. Which I think is your point, because you don't have a channel. Right. There's no, uh, yeah. For that sort of thing. There's no console. But, um, yeah. You know, again, like Mac OS, if you, if you try to throw something with the same IP on a network that somebody else already has, it's going to tell you. It's like, dude, you yeah. know, somebody else already has this, and here's their Mac address, and it tries to help you diagnose the problem. But um, no, yeah. it's a good point because I have one of these smart switches, and I I, I guess the the thing to keep in mind is that the, the, a lot of smart switches, in addition to things like our our pal Eero Dave, they need an IP address on the network. Right. I mean, right. I see that when I run Fing or something like that, I'll see or or even <laughs> their own utility. It'll be like, oh well, here's one of your satellites, and here's another of your satellites, and here's their IP address. I'm like, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right. But, um, we, we've got some tips to go through that I want to burn through yes. pretty quickly just because, burn. well, I think they're good tips. and you Set know. the burn. Yeah, that's good. Um, let's see. Where are we here? I got to get the right ones up. So John noted, uh, he said in 687, where am I here? Oh, yeah. Uh, in Mac Geek Up 687, you were talking about installing a hard drive in an older MacBook Pro. When I replace drives in MacBook Pros and iMacs that don't have the stock SSDs, I always have to reset the PRAM on the machine before it starts acting normally. He said the SATA issue might be, in this case, uh, related to that. Thought it was worth mentioning. You're totally right. Resetting the PRAM and resetting NVRAM, uh, you know, there's a reason that they are in everyone's toolbox because it, it makes a difference. But uh, he says, I think it was mentioned in the chat room, but two things about caching in high Sierra. One is that you can get all the old advanced options in the caching server, including computer to computer caching. If you're in system preferences, sharing content, caching preference pane, uh, Hold down the option key and the options button that you can click turns into advanced options. So you can uh, really tweak that caching server. So thanks, John. That's a uh, that's a good one. I like it. Uh, on Facebook, we were we heard from Zeph and Zeph was asking about the differences between the eight, the iPhone eight and the iPhone 10. And uh we were talking about two things in there and it's a, it's a conversation. If you're on the fence between the two, you know, John, at the end of last episode, we were talking about this and, uh, and I was trying to convince you to get the 10, if you were going to bother to get the eight and the home button is something that the, the absence of the home button becomes a very automatic thing. And honestly, I don't even miss it anymore. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I completely forget about is the screen. I'm used to it. I look at this phone, you know, many times a day. Uh, it, I don't, I don't think about the fact that this is an OLED screen. And when I show anything on my phone, it could be an email, but certainly a picture or something to anybody in my family. The first comment they make is man, that screen. Holy cow. Like every single time it, it becomes no. the conversation as opposed to, hey, okay. look at this thing, you know. So 
just wanted to make sure we we wrap that up. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to challenge you because the, okay. I, I've seen talk of this here and there, but there's a talk of burn-in on that screen. Uh, is there a burn-in on OLEDs? Okay. I mean, I'm not seeing any burn-in on this, but... Okay. No, I've, I've, I've seen articles. But I don't think we've written one. Yeah. Or we may have, and I just missed it. But um, no, I, 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 I saw talk of burn-in, which is a phenomenon, which you should be familiar with, with your uh, plasma screens. Yep. Where some screens, if the same image is displayed too many times, it kind of takes hold and then it ruins everything. So, but you haven't seen that, obviously. No, but you're Other right. With an OLED screen, it. it it could be. I mean, you're right. It the technology is potentially subject to that after you know certain amount of time. We'll put a we'll put a link in the show notes to that. That's 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 a good one, man. Um, but right. OLED, as far as I know, is the superior at the moment other than burn in technology. Yeah, yeah. at <laughs> at the moment, yeah. Uh, you want to, you want to take us to Chris quickly, John? I mean, we're at the minute, we're at the hour 20 mark. We've got two more tips that I want to share. So if we can, we can, we can do these quickly if we can do them quickly. I think we can go if I can, uh, well, you know, I can condense what Chris said. Okay. So we had, uh, yeah, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try to condense it and not expand it, but, um, Anyways, Chris wrote in. So Chris uh, does a uh, uh, Mac service, and he's supported, and, and he's over in Germany. Hello, um, uh, my my family. That's from your there people, as well. man. Yeah. But um, they're my people. Well, you're all my people. You're my people. The listeners, are my people. I think everybody's my people, unless you're a jerk, in which case you're not my people. <laughs> <laughs> but um, here's what he said, which was interesting. So we had a, a question. From someone saying, well, I'm trying to put in a, I think the gist of it was, I'm trying to put an SSD into an older Mac, a 2009 Mac, 2009 MacBook, which had a, I think, SATA 1 or SATA 2 interface. And when they put in this newer drive, newer technology, when they tried to install the OS, it came up with a, what was the term, Dave? I'm trying to find the... Uh, oh, yeah. It was, was that a, crazy error message we talked about some, in the last show. Some, yeah. some probing. But I think what the OS was doing was saying, you know, I'm going to test the throughput of data with this new thing that I see. And if it doesn't work out, I'm going to put up this stupid error message that means nothing to anybody. Because it was something like, you know, inconsistent. What was it? I'm sorry, but it was like a, it was some stupid error message that wouldn't tell you that the problem is that the capabilities of the thing you're trying to talk to exceed the capabilities of the hardware that you have. And that was basically, I think, the gist yeah. of Dave. So to boil it down, the problem is older Macs would have SATA 1 and maybe SATA 2. And we were given examples of this. And and the thing is, um, to boil it down, the, the problem is that, number one, some of the older Macs would allow you to move the firmware to go from SATA 1 to SATA 2. The problem is the wiring. And here was the thing, Dave, kind of like cabling when we're talking about networks. The thing is, if the wiring in the Mac is not capable of doing the throughput, it's not going to work and it's going to fail and you're going to get this error message. And I think that was the gist of this discussion is that if you have a SATA 1, and it, here was the thing that amazed me, Dave, and I never even thought of this, if the cable that connects your computer to the drive is not sufficient, you're going to get errors. I had never even thought of this, that if no. you tried to put a SATA 2 drive into a SATA 1 machine, it would fail because the cable wasn't capable. But when you think about it, it makes sense because sure. you have this with networks. So you have you know, Cat 4, Cat 5, Cat 6, Cat, cat whatever. Yeah. If the cable that connects your physical network or your Ethernet network isn't capable, it's going to fail. Yeah. I never even thought of the possibility that a SATA cable connecting your computer to the drive would not be capable. But that's the deal. So that's sometimes deal. with older Macs, you may have to get a newer SATA cable in order for a newer drive to work properly. All right. That's and amazing. And in 687, David, uh, we, we talked about uh, 
syncing photos in multiple libraries and all of that. And he said, because of my recent experience with iCloud Photo Library and Sync, I got a bit behind the curtain. And uh, and he said, like the caller, I have over 140 gigs of media and my wife has 50 and my daughter has 75. Using iCloud Sync assumes, as John mentioned, that if you exceed the allotted space, just buy a bigger phone or machine or iCloud storage. My concern here is our media creation pace has far overcome my wallet. This is where he says DS Photo from Synology or Synology's Moments. Google's photos or Amazon's approach of a storage service versus a sync service really shine. It says for the caller, just leaving the media in a single library and switching to Google Photos backup would entirely solve his or her problem. No additional local accounts, no iCloud accounts, no multiple libraries, and Google Photos would automatically sort by year versus the manual method of multiple libraries. Uh, you're right. Google Photos d does that. And if you let them recompress your photos, you get two benefits. Number one, you don't pay for storage. Number two, they can go through and analyze your pictures and do all of the, you know, find me pictures of birds or find me pictures of cars and it'll do it. But it does require you to let Google recompress all your pictures. So theoretically, you might lose some quality there. I in the tests I've done, everything looks really good. So I, I haven't seen like any noticeable impact, but there you go. So yeah, you're right. Google photos is, is an alternative there. And if you run the app on your iPhone regularly enough or let it run with background uh, tasks, then it will keep your Google photo library updated as, uh, as often as it can. And, uh, and one last thing, this really kind of blew me away because I had no idea about this, but David says, I think it's the same David. Uh, he said, I've been experimenting with some home automation components and, a, and I settled on a wink to hub. I purchased a few door sensors to give it a go and found something interesting. When I paired the sensors after they were 23 feet away, the hub wouldn't recognize it. This seemed odd because it's such a short, short distance. After some hair pulling with the sensor company, their only advice was to move the hub closer, but that made no sense. Support being no help, he says, I dove into uh, figuring out how it works and came to an interesting conclusion. Z-Wave, which is what this is based on, is a mesh network. So distributing devices throughout the house means that each sensor meshes with another in a similar way to wireless mesh devices, though not using Wi-Fi. He says, knowing this detail solved my 23 foot problem. He said he was able to put devices throughout the house. And as long as there was always one in the middle, uh, it could move things around. And I, I had completely missed the fact that Z wave and, and a lot of those, uh, you know, home control devices are mesh. So there you go. Who knew? I mean, I guess a lot of people knew we just, I never knew. It's crazy. I knew. Good. I saw him at a... No, I was talking to him. Uh, CES. Yeah. Yeah, Z-Wave. There's a few Z things. Yeah, there, there's still this mesh... Yeah. ...of protocols for IoT things to talk to other IoT things. Yeah. And it's still a mess, right? Yeah. That's yeah, why well, you need, like was mentioned, you need one of these hubs. You to, need a hub. And they they have conflicting standards and all of that stuff. Hey, I want to take together. I want to take oh, a minute and thank all of our Mac Geek Gab Premium subscribers that contributed this week. I actually meant to do this earlier in the show, and we got on such a roll that uh, here we are on the biannual plan for uh, at twenty five bucks every six months. We have uh, Guy D, Felix B, Andrew R. And then Anders E, uh, who's on it 35 every six months, and Chuck P, who's on it 50 every six months. Thank you to all of you. You rock. On the monthly $10 plan, we have Paul M, JC, REL, Bob L, Michael P, Santiago M, John D, Stephen A, John V, Jeff P, and Gary B. Thank you to all of you as well. And also to Stephen L, who sent in a one time uh, $10 contribution. You rock, too. You all rock. Thank you so much. It means a lot. It really does. Um, it helps in, in a lot of ways. 
That's uh, that's all we have for today. We told you how to email us. You premium folks can email us at premium at macgeekab.com if you want. We told you how to find us on on uh, Facebook, and there you go. Uh, I do want to say one thing, though, John, and I'll, I'll say it to you as well as to uh, everybody. Uh, to you and, and to a lot of you, I say Merry Christmas. And I hope, because I think this is, in fact, I know this is the last episode we're doing before Christmas. Uh, I know a lot of you are celebrating Hanukkah now. Or were. Or uh, whatever you celebrate, yeah, Dave. There you go. Hey, so, enjoy it's the it. holiday season, and I don't believe there's anything wrong with saying that. Because there's lots of holidays. Hey, everybody have a good time. There you that's, go. That's that's my that's my theory. I, same. Everybody have a good time all the time. Uh, Get together with family, friends. Um, <laughs> try to avoid the uh, severe weather uh, that we often see in the Northeast, but even the rest of the country. It's yeah. crazy out there. It's crazy. What's going on? It's crazy. <laughs> All right, folks. We will. Uh, we will see you next time. I want to thank Cashfly at c a c h e f l y dot com for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. Of course, our sponsors, which OWC we heard about earlier, Smile at smilesoftware dot com, the Barebones folks at barebones dot com. A couple new sponsors coming up too. I hope you have a good week. Whatever it is you're doing, whatever it is you celebrate, have fun. But there is one thing I do want to make sure. It's three simple words. They're important, though. While you're out there having fun, make sure that you don't get caught. Made up.